Okay, and like, uh, good morning. Uh, it's early morning here in Australia. And obviously, welcome to Australia down under. And obviously, this morning, I'd like to really explore the question that I put up. How can we practically turn down the greenhouse warming to cool the earth three watts per square meter safely, profitably and in time? And this is a critical question because humanity, we have a problem, right? And we've known this. We've had 50 years of warnings about climate change, but we've just very narrowly focused on the CO2 symptom from our oxidation of our landscape and more recently fossil fuel use. And the danger is that this narrow focus on CO2 as a, uh, not as a symptom, but basically on CO2 has masked our understanding of actually a much, much more urgent, real climate crisis and of course has prevented actually action to to avoid it and of course this crisis is the intensification of dangerous hydrological climate extremes we're experiencing that all over the world be it in hurricanes storms floods drought aridification and wildfires and these hydrological climate extremes are intensifying as Joachim Schellenhuber, you know, really documented and there's no dispute scientifically. And they now threaten the collapse of biosystems. They really are threatening our water and food security and social stability. And so basically while hydrology gives life, it's also hydrology that kills. Okay, CO2 doesn't necessarily kill you until it's 10,000 parts per million, but basically water kills. And so really we have this imperative, how do we prevent these dangerous hydrological uh, climate extremes? And how can we safely cool the climate so as to offset the heating that is driving these extremes? And the bottom line is, we must do that this decade because the way that these extremes are accelerating and impacting, we may only have a decade left before they really impact both economic, ecological, and also social stability. And the other reality is that science dictates that we can't actually reduce these hydrological extremes just by reducing CO2 emissions or CO2 levels. In fact, the CO2 is such a blunt tool because there's 38,000 billion tons of CO2 in the oceans. So this is a massive buffer with massive lag effects and it will take centuries for even zero net emissions of CO2 to meaningfully reduce warming, the locked in warming and therefore any impact on these extremes. And basically, carbon now is, it's far too little and too late to ex stop ex exceeding the 1.5 degrees centigrade safe warming thresholds that we set in Paris. And basically that we risk breaching or exceeding within a decade. So we need something much, much more uh, significant, radical, and the proposition is, can we turn to nature and really ask, well, how did nature cool the planet? How does nature actually regulate the heat dynamics of the blue planet? And if we do, we actually say there's a massively important good news here, because we can still safely cool the climate if we can restore the Earth's natural hydrological cooling processes. These processes govern 95% of the heat dynamics of the blue planet, and they've regulated its climate for over 4 billion years, including most of the greenhouse effect, which we'll explain. By contrast, the CO2 component of the greenhouse gas effect represents about 4% of the global heat dynamics. And of course, CO2 has varied markedly over those 4 billion years. 
So let's just look at the simple science of cooling and what we need to achieve. Obviously, the Earth as a planet continually receives some 342 watts per square meter on average, continually from the sun. And to maintain its stable temperature, it obviously has to basically return 342 watts per square meter back out to space. And it's totally accepted that our enhanced abnormal greenhouse effect has resulted in us retaining an extra three watts per square meter in the Earth's atmosphere. And so we must return this extra three watts per square meter back out to space. Significantly, it's less than 1% of the incident solar radiation coming into the Earth. So yes, we have a problem. Yes, we have an imperative, but it is a 1% correction on global heat input output. And so we can basically address this, look at this as nature does and fix it, provided we also look at what are the hydrological processes nature uses to regulate this heat dynamics. And of course, there's a sequence of process, but let's just focus on four of the key ones. And the first, of course, we can avoid this or generate this cooling by enhancing the evapotranspiration because evapotranspiration takes heat from the land surface and moves it into the air and then largely out to space through its latent heat effect, which transfers some 85 watts per square meter of the 342 watts per square meter incident solar radiation. So evapotranspiration by itself does about 24% of that cooling process naturally. We can also actually cool the planet by reducing the production of haze nuclei. It's these micronuclei that create the humid hazes that retain moisture in the air and actually result in the warming and aridification of those air masses. And of course, we've artificially increased these haze nuclei. And again, their reduction can reduce up to 30 watts per square meter of heat retention in the atmosphere. At the very powerful level, we can also restore the nucleation of clouds, which have a global albedo cooling effect of some 120 watts per square meter. And when we're looking at these data, always think back, we have a task of putting an extra three watts per square meter back out into space. So these natural processes are extremely powerful and even minor changes to these processes can naturally cool the planet. But perhaps practically and very innovatively, the, the most uh, practical thing we might be able to do is to actually directly turn down the greenhouse effect. And this comes to the Stefan Boltzmann equation, simple physics, because the amount of re-radiation from the Earth is governed by the Earth's temperature, the surface temperature. And if we keep that surface temperature of the Earth cooler, it will re-radiate massively less heat back into space. And it is this re-radiation of this infrared heat from hot soils, which is in fact the driver of the greenhouse effect. So by keeping soil surfaces, land surfaces, protected, hydrated, and cool, we can massively directly turn down the key energy driver of the greenhouse effect. We can do that irrespective of how many greenhouse gas molecules are in the air, because by definition, a greenhouse gas molecule can't absorb heat that hasn't been re-radiated. So basically, by simply keeping landscapes protected, hydrated, cooler, we can significantly turn down some 60 watts per square meter of net warming effect generated by our enhanced greenhouse. 
And collectively, these natural hydrological processes now give us a, a very powerful, safe, natural means of cooling the planet, not within centuries that it might take for CO2 to have an effect, but literally within weeks as we actually build these hydrological cooling balances back again. And of course, we can do that by simply rehydrating the landscape. All of these processes, of course, depend on water, all depend on water being available in the landscape. And so by definition, a key action point is simply regenerating the Earth's soil carbon sponge, because it's that regeneration of the sponge that allows us to infiltrate, retain, and make available rainwater. And it's what enables plant systems to extend their longevity of green growth and transpiration, and thereby natural hydrological cooling. So, you know, we have here a very simple natural processes that nature used to create the cooler climate, the, the Pleistocene climate we live in, that we can also restore. Just as powerfully, we can also basically restore these through empowering grassroots community action everywhere on the planet, particularly youth, particularly young people taking the initiative on on each square meter of soil, each hectare of soil, and effectively protecting, regreening, revegetating it. And basically extending the longevity of protective green growth across the planet. And doing that via farming, forestry, urban agriculture, and village cropping systems. And so instead of our oxidative agriculture over the last 100 years that has accelerated and created over 5 billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland, which is covering about 40% of the land, the potential is for natural and regenerative farming practices to now reverse this aridification, to rehydrate those soils, and in that processes, restore these natural hydrological cooling processes in time. Of course, to do this, we need to return CO2, the symptom of our land oxidation, back into the soil as stable soil carbon, to regenerate the sponge, to restore its natural in-soil reservoirs and heat buffers, to secure our water and food needs, and restore healthy biosystems and hydrologic cooling, effectively addressing most of the UN sustainable development goals that we all agree we must reach. As in nature, we can do this land regeneration, this carbon drawdown, sponge rebuilding within decades. Innovative farmers all over the world are drawing down up to 10 tons of carbon per hectare per annum through their innovative agroecologies. Collectively, globally, we could basically draw down 20 billion tons of carbon per annum to get to negative net emissions by 2030. We've got papers and details on the processes can do that, but all of them are practical, profitable, doable. And it's really this whole realization that it's actually using that resource, the CO2 in the air, as the building blocks for restoring our sponges, our hydrology, our cooling, that is really where the enormous opportunity is for grassroots, innovative farmer action to rebuild healthy landscapes and future. So the key question is, and the imperative is, can we and will we affect these changes at scale and in time to avoid what will inevitably otherwise be a collapse of our biosystems and communities within decades. You know, have we got the will and the capacity to break the inertia of the status quo that has prevented us from doing this over the last 
50 years. Certainly case studies confirm that we can do this practically and profitably, case studies whether in India, US, Europe, Australia. But basically, we have to accept that nature bats last, nature is in control, she will use these processes to regenerate these biosystems to cool the planet. And the only question is, do we want to be part of it, helping her do it, or let her do it after we destroy ourselves? So the future is in our own hands. It's in our wise regeneration and management of our soils, hydrology, and landscape. And let's hope we wise up and take the action we need to in time. So thank you very much.